Um, we have an exam coming up on Wednesday that will be in class. We'll do yes, no, maybe in just a moment, so you can ask me what's on the exam. Um, I didn't see anything on Slack, so I'm going to assume you all brought your questions today. So, um, just a, a correction from last time. I alluded to this on our Slack page and on the video. I made a mistake. I didn't divide this by two right here. So that was my first error. Um, sorry about that. In recognizing kernels, you need to know where everything is. So that really is a easy to fix error, but critical. Again, this thing has to be positive. So there's a constraint on gamma, which is the scalar. Omega is k by k positive definite. And this is a distribution on k by k positive definite matrices. Uh, the expectation of this is that times that right there. So if I want to center everything in omega and build that interpretation, I can divide this by gamma if you want to. And rescale it so that, and it really is just uh, for your convenience. If you like to interpret things particular ways, you can do that. So and build that in without any arbitrariness. I'm just going to change how you think about gamma itself. Um, but in some sense, everything's being centered around a scale, well, a scale factor of that gamma times omega. And these are matrices that are kind of bouncing around that in some sense. So they're not bouncing off any way, any which way. Um, let me just ask a quick question. How do we know omega is invertible? I always think about that anytime I see a matrix inverted. Because it's positive definition. The determinant is not zero. That's right. The determinant is not zero. It's positive definite. So positive definite matrices are invertible. And so uh, Liang went through a theorem. So he said something else. But those are equivalent to each other. And so there's all these equivalencies. Um, so it is invertible. And B will be invertible. So the analysis that we did last time, if we had done our sanity check, we would have caught this. So let's just do our sanity check real quick. So the prior distribution that we're advocating is on sigma inverse. So that's invertible. That's the precision matrix. And that's because in the joint multivariate normal form, um, which is just this thing inside of the product, sigma inverse is appearing. Now, usually people write sigma inverse there, and maybe not there, but as I told you before, we can pull that minus one inside right here, product everything up. Um, I'm gonna apply two steps right here. So I apply the trace, remember the exponent is scalar, so I can apply the trace <laughs> without changing anything. And then I can invoke some properties that so the sum slides out in cyclic permutations preserve the trace. And you proved that on the last couple. And so I applied those. And so coming up with the posterior is easy as multiplying the prior times the length. That's base one of one. So the posterior looks like this. So again, it's this term times that term. So this will be sigma invert. Will be n, everything's over 2 here. Plus gamma, minus k, minus 1. Just like in the gamma analysis, I never lose those because I'll use them to identify which, um, which arc this is. So I'll multiply, so multiplication, e to the minus 1 half trace. Then I've got some terms in here. So I have this outer product term. I goes from 1 to n, xi minus mu, xi minus mu transpose. Give myself a little bit of room. Plus omega invert. That's coming from a plot prior times sigma invert. So that's what it looks like. This thing finds that. So we've got all our terms. So which wish art is this? If we know the parameterization of the wish art, we can write it all down. I made a secondary mistake when I wrote all this down. I should have inverted that matrix that I cut right here. So keep in mind the notation that we used right here is omega 
and this thing appears as an input. So we've got to be a little bit careful about this if we want to apply the formulas the way that we know it. So I'll get rid of this. So this is going to be a wish art with this matrix xi minus mu, xi minus mu, transpose, i goes from 1 to n, plus omega invert, all inverted. So I didn't have that invert there. And then where do I recognize all the other stuff? It's right here. So n plus gamma. This is starting to feel pretty familiar. The ends show up, the data shows up in the posterior, and probably some way that kind of makes some sense. So I usually, the first thing I'll look at in a distribution is the expectation, because I'm just a human. So it's an easy thing to look at. Where's this thing centered? Maybe that's a good idea. If I thought about the gamma distribution, it's skewed, and I probably wouldn't always report the mean. But it should mean something. It's not so heavily skewed or multimodal that I can't think about the mean as a reasonable statistic to report. At least it's in the mass of the distribution. This is a lot like that in multivariate form. So the expectation of this thing is this thing times that. And we probably should have done this last time. Just to conclude, everything makes sense and we've done everything in a reasonable way. So this is going to look like sum of the xi's minus mu, xi's minus mu transposed plus omega inverted. Inverted times n plus gamma. If you've studied some multivariate normal theory, which I'd be surprised if you never have, and try to estimate a covariance matrix, you probably do something like this. So if you knew mu, you would probably take this outer product and divide it by gamma. This is upside down from all of that. Remember, our inference is on the precision scale. So it's the invert of that. And that's probably what most people would do. If you didn't know mu, you would plug in x bar, and you would probably subtract off k right there as well, and use the unbiased estimator. The Bayesian estimator is always biased a little bit. And so it has a penalty term here. You can think about how you want to control everything. So where you want things centered. So if you didn't have a lot of data, this can be really important. So in the high dimensional analysis, you might want to give things a little bit of traction. I do that all the time. And have some little penalty here. You probably don't want this to be a huge number. So just looking at that, it's going to yank that thing way over. So you probably just want to build a little bit of traction. So quite often I let this be something like the identity. But if you're in finance and you're looking at the relationship between different stocks, so that's kind of what they're doing a lot of times in complicated forms, is seeing how stocks do together. So they're digging, building up these groups and understanding what moves together. Um, you might know something about the sectors and be able to say something about it. So that if you saw some little anomalous little blip, on the stock market, which happens all the time, it wouldn't skew the analysis a ton. You know, it would move it a little bit. So you can think about that how you want. I'll let you play around with this in a not high dimensional case. So next time for the homework, if you want to get started after the midterm, I'm sure that's exactly what you'll want to jump to. Um, I'll have you code up the Gelfand expense. So I'm going to have you keep practicing with the uh, Metropolis samplers or the Gibbs samplers. My experience is, is that people that don't have a lot of experience with that at the beginning make a lot of mistakes. And so spending enough time so that you can sit down and say, I don't know, this could be take me 20 minutes or eight hours. So it's kind of at the expense of your experience. So um, really, I hope you're able to diagnose non-convergence of your Markov chains. So you can say this thing's definitely not working. So that's probably a really important thing. So if you are going to be wielding this stuff, you need to be able to say it doesn't look like it works. The trace plots are the informal way to do it, but it's good enough for right now. Patrick? By saying, uh, on the Jeffries Pryor stuff, um, yeah. by saying it's transformation invariant, yes. are we saying that the Jacobian evaluates to a scalar? No. 
So, not saying that. Yeah, in the linear case, it would be that way. So, the transformation variant things. So, in the linear case, it's that way, but I'm just able to do a little bit of theory. What I'm saying is that, the, okay, so let's switch gears. Patrick wants to move on. So, we're done with Wishart um, and said a few things about ANC. You'll get lots of practice with that throughout the class. Jeffrey's prime. So, it's this formula. What I'm saying is this formula right here. So the Jacobian is not necessarily a scalar. It just so turns out that if you transform this formula, and I worked in a different parameterization, let's say phi. So where maybe we say something like phi, so I'll say G inverse phi is equal to theta. So that's my transform. I'm saying that this term pops up automatically. You don't need to think about it. So if you use this formula, and somebody else uses this formula on a different parameterization scale, you guys are gonna be talking about equivalent things. And placing the same amount of mass in the same places when you transform. So remember what a probability distribution does. So if I have something that's a PDF, so continuous thing, I wind up with this. P theta, I end up calling this usually G inverse D, and then D, DG inverse V, D V, but this is a theta. It's just another name for theta in disguise. And so this same relationship happens right here. So let's do an example and really drive home the point of what I mean. So hopefully through an example you'll see this. This isn't a coincidence, it's because of this relationship. So any function that has this relationship built into it, that in the transformation space you see this Jacobian factor pop up, that's transformation invariance. Let's see what it means practically. So we'll go about things two different ways and we'll show things are equivalent. And that's what we mean by invariance. So I change something, but nothing really changes. Okay. So our old example, example last time. save the time and not recycle the example right now, but we did this last time. We came up with the Jeffries prior on P. And our example concerns X's are coming from a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared is equal to P. I chose the precision parameterization because I like that one for arbitrary reasons. So this thing right here we worked out this calculation. We did it like this, using the second derivative. And it saves us some math. So we did it like this. Remember the negative sign out in front of there. So I just plugged into this formula, V to the 1 half, E to the minus, P over 2, X minus mu squared. I did a little bit of calculus. And at the end of the day, this turned out to be, oops, I have to take this and raise it to the half power. So the thing inside the half power is called the information, Fisher's information. It pops up in a lot of different contexts, and this one is entirely different from probably the context that you know. And I cannot make a relationship between those two things. So we like this one because it's transformation in there. So kind of an equal. There's also an admissibility property that we're not gonna go into here. Um, and I'll say something more about it when we get into decision theory. So this turned out to be proportional to 1 over phi. So if you do the math or you go back to the lecture last time, you'll see I worked this thing out last time. Let's say somebody else is working on the variance scale. So instead of writing down square, sigma squared right here, I'm going to call that V for variance. You'll see why I do this in a second. 
Okay, so I'm going to try to work out the Jeffrey's prior on V. I'm just going to follow this formula. So I'm not even putting any thought into anything. It's a nice problem to be asked on an exam. It's just a simple calculation. This is going to look like this. Two derivatives on V. You can already see why I don't like sigma squared it's sitting right there. Because the exponent would mean two different things. And that drives me crazy. So I'll just write this down. This is going to be 1 over V hat. So sigma squared to the 1 half. So there's a sigma sitting right down there. E to the minus 1 half x minus mu over v and that's squared. So I've got my formula. Don't forget your logs. Once you start taking derivatives, you'll figure out real quickly you didn't take a log if you didn't take a log. It'll become a real mess. So this is going to be minus, oops, and I need to raise this to the half power. So I'll just write down by e, that's this part. And we'll take the half power at the end. So this is minus expectation. I'll do it slowly, just so we don't make a ton of mistakes. So this is going to be logarithm of 1 over b to the half. So this is going to be a minus 1 half log b. Minus 1 half x minus mu squared over b. Keep me honest. So I'll take my first derivative, just slide it through. So this is going to be minus 1 half 1 over b. It's the derivative of log b. And then this is the inverse right here, so I'm going to bring down the minus 1 decrement by exponent. So this will become a plus 1 half x minus mu squared b squared. Apologies if you like me to write it as the inverse. I actually do that in my head. So and I see it that way. So minus, we'll do this again, make sure we control all our minus signs. Take another derivative all the way through. We don't lose our terms this time. So, but everything works out just fine. So this is going to be a minus 1 comes down, so plus 1 half 1 over b squared minus the 2's cancel. So the 1 half I bring down to minus 2. There's a minus sign right there. x minus mu squared over v cubed. I've got a little bit of work to do. So I've got this minus sign right here. So this is going to be minus 1 half 1 over v squared is the expectation minus expectation x minus mu squared and I'll factorize out the v cubed. I'm going to have to be careful. So x is the random variable right here. So that's what we're taking the expectation over. So it doesn't disappear. When we work through this, we're really fortunate. By working through the double derivative formula, we didn't have any x's. So it's a piece, piece of cake. So keep in mind, we get the condition on all our parameters. We're taking the expectation over x. So this is what's called the expected Fisher information. There's empirical forms of this that people will use for that other reason. But I've never seen it here. OK, so what's this thing right here? What that says is expectation of x minus mu squared. Somebody help me out. That's b. That's what variance is. That's the definition of variance. So this thing 
it's going to be minus, this will be one half v squared minus v over v cubed. This had better be negative. So this is just v squared, one over v squared right there. So one of the v's cancel. And so as a sanity check for you, this thing would always be negative. If it's not, you made a mistake. On problems like this, when I got started, I'd make mistakes all the time. So you just practice over and over again with different distributions. So this looks like minus, minus, one half v squared. So that thing's a positive, one half v squared. And as promised, this will always be just defined up to proportionality. So that's the Fisher information. This is proportional to one over v squared. And so Jeffrey's prior is finalized once I take the half power. And I'll do that up here. So after all that work, we wound up with one over v squared and a half, which is one over v. It's kind of a neat thing. Scale parameters always pop up regardless of how you parameterize up. Is one over that thing is going to be the prior. So let's just check real quickly. So if I decided to work with v, that's the prior I would have advocated. If I tried to work with phi, this is the prior we would have advocated. This is what I mean by transformation invariance. These priors are the same. They convey the exact same information. So what I mean is if I transform this one in the V space, I should come up with that prior. And if I started with that prior and I transformed in the V space, I should come up with this prior. So they're the same priors. Let's see that. And that happens because of this identity that we proved last time. So that's what the math is saying it's guaranteed to happen because it falls into that form. So let's just transform. Transform pi phi, I'll write it down like this, proportional to one over phi into pi phi. We don't know what this is. So my formula right here is going to be E is equal to 1 over V. So this is my G inverse V, if you will. V is 1 over V. That's the easiest inverse function, inverse function to look at. These are all positive, so I don't have to worry about this. This is a bijection, no problems. So I'm going to take pi V. I'm just going to apply my formula. I really should be writing down proportionality because what I have in the beginning is up to proportionality. So we'll correct that in a second. So this is going to be 1 over phi, but instead of writing down phi, I'm going to write a 1 over v. So that's just phi right here. So this is just pi phi g inverse v. And then I take d g inverse v. Keep that thing positive. Don't you need to square that? Oh. Don't you need to square the Jacobian? Why? Because uh, for the I part, it's square root. There's no I here, so I'm just transforming a probability density. So I'm using the rule that we knew weeks ago, that we knew from probability class. So I'm taking this probability distribution, regardless of how I got it. Oh, I got you. And just transform it. And so we're going to show that it's equivalent. Yeah, so a little bit of blending of concepts there. So, so this thing is going to be 1 over 1 over v, I'll re rewrite that as v times dg inverse, or d inverse. So that'll be the minus 1 v minus 2, if you will. Absolute value there. Again, it's the chain rule that's making all that happen, and I think I went over that in a review session. So this is going to be v over 1 over v squared is 1 over v. That's what that little proof says will happen, is because this 
information to the half power adheres to this property automatically, that if you use that rule, and everybody uses that rule, and everybody has the same likelihood functions, they agree on the modeling dynamics, they just don't agree on how they parameterize things and they use this rule, they'll come up with the same answers. So that's kind of nice. And so if you were able to work out a Jeffrey's prior on a different transformation scale and work out that whatever the formula is, minus expectation, two derivatives of the log likelihood function, take the expectation, if you're able to work that out a little cleaner in a different transformation space and then do this calculation, you know, easier, maybe that's an easier way through a problem. And I'll make sure that you understand that on the video. So there's a fast way and a slow way to do problems. I won't make you um, have too much insight before you do it. I'll set it up in the easy direction for you. And then make sure that you understand what transformation and variance means. So that's what Jeffrey's prior does. So Jeffrey, physicist, he understood the arbitrariness of writing down models and wanted to make sure that his inferences were equivalent to arbitrary transforms. That's a good idea. There's other good reasons for picking this prior. So we're not going to go into all of them right now. This isn't the only transform invariant function in the world. This has a lot of good reasons to pick this one. Um, I'll say some things about it. So let me just mention uh, the other Jeffrey's priors that you know about. For mu and a normal distribution, you'd work out that that's proportional to a constant. You come out to be something that's constant. It's going to have V included in here, right here, but V doesn't determine the shape of it. So if you do work through that, you'll come up with something that's constant with respect to mu. Um, for p in a binomial distribution, you'd work out that this is proportional to p to the half minus 1, 1 minus p to the half minus 1. It doesn't give you the proportionality constant, but if you normalize this, you'd know what it is. So this is a beta half half. So what I wanted to say is that, at least in one dimensional analyses, that beta half half worked really good, and we didn't discuss um, transformation spaces. We just took P for what it was and operated on that scale. And now we might be thinking, maybe that's totally arbitrary, that we think about P on a scale of 0 to 1. Why don't we think of 1 over P? It's equivalent. I mean, it's a funky shape. But maybe we should be thinking about that. I'm not sure. You know, But it's easier for us to think about it on that scale. But if we did inference on 1 over P scale, we might need to think a little bit harder. So we didn't have a lot of good intuition for picking this other than it has that U shape thing. So it turns out in one dimension, these are also what are called reference priors. And I know I brought up that term a lot. Um, but a lot of people, what they're doing is they're taking Jeffrey's priors and just producting them together. And they're saying, I'm working with the marginal reference prior analysis. The reference prior has the, prop, prop, the, the property that at least in some distance function, or at least it's a divergence function, it's the KL divergence that the posterior moves away from the prior as fast as possible. And so that's kind of nice. So if I had like a point mass prior, and I said theta is this value, and it couldn't be anything else, my posterior could be my prior. You have zero mass everywhere else, and no matter what the likelihood said, I'd say it's this, this is my value. I call those political priors. I don't change my mind with them. So you can never move away from no matter what your data does. These Jeff reference priors, and there's a high dimensional analog to all of this, and they are not Jeffrey's priors in high dimension, but they're at least close, and in one dimension, they're the same. And so you can't have it all in high dimensional spaces, but in 1D, you can kind of have it all. And so in one dimension, at least, these are optimal in a lot of senses. 
So it also has that invariance that we talked about. So when we looked at um, pi t, I was trying to convince you that this was something that was called scale invariant. And if you think about location scale families and why this pops up is the um, location, or it pops up always is this factor right here. They're very related to each other. I'll just mention that if we did work on a shift scale, we would wind up is this is the Jeffries prior. And it's just the transform of that right here. So we could just transform one to the other. And scale parameters on logarithmic scales are shift parameters. And so shift parameters we usually place black priors on. So this operates as a shift parameter in logarithmic space. If you didn't want to think about all that, Jeffries prior will give you all of these. So it just kind of is the auto thing. I'm not saying that's what you should always do, but I would say probably at least half the time I'm doing something like this. So invoking some property and then using a formula, and then I do that. And what I usually also do is I usually try to think of something else that's reasonable to do. And then I compare them to each other. And I show how much they move. And if it doesn't move a lot, then I'm happy. And if it moves a lot, then I think over it. So that's about what I'm going to advocate to you today. Let's do yes, no, maybe. So we've got 20 minutes. Any questions before we get there? OK. Patrick, did I answer your question? Um. Yeah, I guess I was just... So transformation invariant means that you can use that Jacobian... I can transform that distribution. If we both use the same rule, yeah. then um, we're going to have the same information. Let me show you real quick a non-transformation invariant rule. Okay. Okay. So not transform invariant. Question. that I choose, I pick a flat prior. It seems really nice. You're just using the likelihood. I'm using it on whatever scale you've represented it on, and you're just done. Fisher tried to incline us to do that for a small period of his career, and it's a stupid idea. <laughs> That's just all there is to it. So you want to regularize that space. And there's a lot of examples why you don't want to do that. Scale parameters are a good example of that. So what I mean is, Let's say I was looking at x, normally distributed, and I've got my parameterization as the way that I choose it right here. So what I mean right here is p of x is equal to I'll say proportional to phi to the half e to the minus one half x minus mu squared. But I could change my mind about this. And I could say, I don't like thinking about mu on this scale right here. It's not how, the way I like to think about it. I like to introduce this new parameterization. And I'll just say, let's let mu be greater or equal to zero. So we're working with a truncated model, and I can just do something just to demonstrate a point. So I'm going to say x's are distributed according to whatever this parameter is psi, and I'm going to call this 1 over mu, right there. Nobody's ever done this in the history of me being a professional statistician. I've never heard anybody say, I like to talk about inverse means. You know, for precisions, that happens all the time. Again, this is kind of a concept that's not supernatural, but at least the mean is on the same scale as the data. So usually, you're thinking about the mean on the same scale as the thing that you're measuring. So I could write it down like this. It wouldn't change the way I wrote down phi e to the minus 1 half x minus 1 over psi. Right here, squared. And I'll throw my phi up here. 
So I'm going to change my interpretation. But this is the same thing. If I plugged in one over me right here, that's mu. And so I could control the mean by moving this linearly, or I could control the mean by moving this parameter. Now here, I didn't shift this thing around. It changed the value of this. So again, I've excluded zero just so that I can make this point. And so flat priors on everything. So what that would mean is that if I worked on mu scale, I'd come up with that prior. And that seems like a good idea. It's been a good idea, so okay, maybe it's a good idea. Now let's think about what that means. So if I transform to feed space, or what is this? Psi space. Psi. So what I do, so that we understand what those functions are, there's something different. So what I'm going to write down is pi mu, and I'm going to plug in mu is equal to 1 over psi. Then I'm going to take psi. I take the derivative of it. So if I transform this to this space right here, what's this thing? This was still proportional to 1, so there's no shape there. It's just that when I plug that thing in, but now I've got this, 1 over psi squared. So I will say, if you did like this prior, and somebody inclined you to work on psi scale, it means you like that. These are equivalent to each other. These mean the same thing. But if I followed my rule right here, I would have just done this, proportional to 1. And if I transform this over to mu, it certainly wouldn't be flat anymore. So flat priors on everything is not invariant because when I go to transform them, they're not flat anymore. So that's kind of what I've said. I would love if that were the case. If I transformed flat priors and they were always flat priors, there'd be so many cavities in mathematics if that were true. So that's just not true. I can wish for things. So I'll wish for things that might actually happen. Patrick? Uh, so we, what you're saying then is that transform invariant means that if you work out the Jacobian stuff, it's the same form just with the different variables. That's what it means. And now you can kind of parse together the words transform invariant. See that when I apply that transformation, I don't change anything. So we're all, all operating through the same rule. If I did transform your prior, I would get the same prior that I get. If we were all following the same. So a lot of people. So humans, don't tell me what to do, but give me an automatic procedure. <laughs> so it also has other good problems. It's not the only thing going. So I will just make a final point that the joint Jeffries priors are not, in general, the product of two more joint Jeffries priors. We can talk about that later. Okay, yes, no babies. I did write the exam. It's pretty easy. Uh, it does require you to know your distributions and their properties if you're going to finish it on time. So you're really kind of just taking all these problems that we do, transforming, working out posterior distributions, recognizing everything, understanding the properties of your parameters. So if you know all your distributions, that's not that hard. So hopefully I can get you to study lots about distributions. You know. Um, but why don't you guys ask? Wouldn't you always like to ask, at least in non mask wearing years? Chi distribution? Reason? What's that? Is the chi squared distribution? It could be. So in um, any distribution that we've touched, it's there. So I'll just give you a hint. Chi squareds are part of gammas. And gammas also encapsulate other distributions. So gammas are on there. So, but I'm not going to ask you anything that specifically requires you to know chi-squared. But I will ask you things, you know, a little bit more familiar. But what I would recommend doing is knowing that connection between a chi-squared and a gamma, so that you know that this parameter is like there's always a two sitting there or a half, depending on the form that you're looking at. So one of those parameters in a gamma is a two or a half, depending on which scale you're looking at. I always make that thing a half. Some people make it two, so depending on which scale you're looking at. Um, I would know that stuff. 
So that's what I'm hoping you'll, you'll train yourself on. So JAMAs, yeah, in some form, it'll be there. Just please. Is the wish art distribution? No wish art. If I can't remember it, I should probably show it. No wish art. I have to look it up all the time. And I have to look up my integrating constant depending on if I'm working with uh, inverse wish art or wish art. So I always run to the tables every time I do that. I'll probably do the same thing when you guys ask me on the next one. Who? Somebody's next. Jeffrey's Pryor. Jeffrey's Pryor is definitely there, right? It's just so easy to grade that problem. <laughs> you know? So which distribution? I don't know. Do a whole bunch of them. Do all the ones that we played around with. I'll just go down the line. Uh, T distribution? Well, could be, yeah. So I, I'll say um, it's so very, very, very maybe. So this isn't absolutely set in stone, but yeah, T distribution is there. Yeah, good job. You're anticipating. Forecasting. Say again. Forecasting. Forecasting. So posterior predictions. Yeah. Totally. I love it. I like when you can determine what the exam is. I'll make it harder next time. Multivariate normal. Multivariate normal is there. Yeah. I guess I said I would tell you if you asked. So. Multivariate normal is there. It's just too important. Yeah, so no, no real curveballs. Metropolis has testing. I didn't do it. So <laughs> yeah. It should be a maybe. I should just say maybe. And I've done it before, but I'll make your life easy. So no metropolis hastings. I'll be drilling you on this soon. Um, so, I'll be nice. No. I'll oh, well, It is metropolis. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, sometimes I do mess that up, though, and I, I tell you the wrong thing. I've done that before, but no, I didn't do it again. So on this one, I didn't do it again. I'll let you try to play around with it a little bit more so that we can go back to the theory and we come back around. you will appreciate it. Like, I, I never really got it the other way. I mean, I was a math major, but it was like after I did things, I really understood what the whole theory was. Okay, so let's go back. Let me give you a hint. Probably. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you to prove the iterated form. But certainly they will be very valuable in a hierarchical model, like a posterior predictive distribution. So, yeah, it would help you. You don't have to use them. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns it from a two-minute problem into yeah. a two-hour problem. Yes. Credible intervals? Yes. You might be thinking like, what could I possibly ask? Know what they are. Understand them. It's the highest posterior density. So if I gave you a distribution, could you find it? How would you do it? So I'm gonna make it simple enough that you can do something. So I think knowing what they are and understanding conceptually how you compute them, at least that algorithm I told you where you're kind of lowering the line and collecting mass, you understand that it would be a good shift. I can't believe when people get that problem wrong. It freaks me out. It happens. Don't be that person. That particular problem is that particular No, I'm not asking. That one. So that's where I don't want you to get all hung up. So I'm not asking you a more complicated comparison type question. So 
No, it'll be it'll be continuous and not set. So well, say let me say that again. It'll be in a continuous space, um, but it might be multi. -level. Don't worry, it's not gonna it's not a math problem. I'm asking. It's not gonna be any complex mathematics. I engineered the problem to detect whether or not you know what a credible word is. Warren, anything about the proper posteriors? Not yet. So no. So if the max likelihood exists, that sort of thing, and the prior is proper, the posterior is proper, could you prove it? That'd be really nice if that was a question, wasn't it? Because <laughs> it's pretty easy. Um, no, I'm not asking that. Uh, the article we read at the beginning of the semester. Can you say it again? Sorry. It's about, like, how about, like, I think we read at the beginning of the semester. Stop from the beginning of the semester? I don't know. The article. article. On our oh, um, the history. <laughs> yeah, I've done this sort of nonsense before. <laughs> and it is so impossible to grade you guys. <laughs> when I ask you, like, tell me your opinion about something. <laughs> no, I won't ask about the history of statistics on this one. I've kind of even gotten past asking you definitions. I just haven't built into the questions. I can see if you know or if you don't know. Here, let's go here and we'll circulate. Regression? Regression, yeah, in some sense. So a multivariate normal thing should set you up for a regression problem. So it will be there. Um, yeah. There were some others. Please. It's a contender. So I'll put it as a maybe. There's certainly the sort of distributions that I want you to know. So I'm not going to hassle you too hard on distribution, but I really do want you to spend the time, you know? It's value. You know what these distributions are, you know what their properties are. Bada bing, bada boom, you can build a bot. Run a give sampler, and you're a professional bot. Somebody, oh, well, Cauchy distribution? Maybe. <laughs> so, in some form. But maybe not, but if you know about t-distributions, then it, you know, has that cozy thing in there. So I'll say that problem that we've been working through that scale mixture thing is there. So maybe I ask you about some other distribution or something that's just one step away from the home. So, yeah, but the t-distribution thing is there. Just for the record, t1s are Cauchy's. This is how I remember all my distributions. So I know how they're best. It takes a little while to know that stuff. But six months of graduate school to do it if you spend your time appropriately. Flashcards on the refrigerator, all the tricks. Memorization is not a hard game to figure out. It's a repeat. Who else? Conjugate prior. Conjugate prior will be there. Yep. Guaranteed. So you guys are doing pretty good here. You didn't ask the most popular question. And maybe you know the answer already. How many questions? Uh, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so five. Yeah. Five questions, multi-part, all kind of, you know, this in a in a flow. I could ask you the very last question, but there'll be a sequence. The final will be a little bit harder than that, but I'll give you more time for it. So I just want you to understand the fundamentals, these things. So it'd be cool if you understood the MH stuff, but I think we still need a little bit more time there. So I haven't proven why that thing works. Just demoed it. Okay, I think everybody's in good shape. So um, good luck. I'll see you Wednesday morning. Try to be on time. There's a few people that are consistently late. Don't do it, you know, so he'll disturb your neighbors and all that. So I'll be here early with the exams. I'll have them face down when you come in and hand them out. I'll read the question for two minutes what? so that we all know what the questions are and you can scan your exam, and then you're going to be underway. So if there's people aren't barging at the door, I'll give you five extra minutes, but we're not going to get more than that.
Cool. Oh. Thanks, you guys.